Good morning. It is an honor and privilege to introduce these gentlemen. After America was blindsided by the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, our country understood we were at war and had to fight. And to deliver a well-placed punch, you first need to lead with a jab. A then Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle knew a thing or two about fighting and spearheaded a bold plan to deliver a jab to the Japanese Imperial military. Volunteer air crews immediately began training, utilizing modified Mitchell B-25 bombers. When Lieutenant Colonel Doolittle ordered the air crews to California, he instructed his men to test and use the skills learned. Not wanting to disappoint the Lieutenant Colonel, the crew of the ruptured duck tried out their low-flying skills by flying under the San Francisco Bay Bridge. On the morning of April 18, 1942, just 10 days after our surrender to the Bataan Peninsula, Lieutenant Colonel Doolittle and 79 Raiders took flight from the USS Hornet and successfully dropped bombs on targets in Japanese cities. Due to a lack of fuel, almost all the Raiders were forced to bail out of their planes over China or crash land. Most eventually made it to safety after enduring many hardships. Lieutenant Colonel Doolittle and his Raiders gave Americans a reason to be hopeful in a bleak time. Militarily, the Raiders' jab made Imperial Japan pull back some of its air power to protect the mainland, which opened the way for a mighty punch to the Imperial Japanese in the Battle of Midway. Please give a warm welcome to Major General David M. Jones, pilot of plane number five forced to bail out over China. Colonel Richard C. Cole, co-pilot of plane number one who bailed out over China. Colonel Bill Bowers, pilot of plane number 12 who bailed out over China. Colonel Thomas Griffin, navigator of plane number nine who force landed in China. And Master Sergeant Ed Horton, engineer and gunner of plane number 10 who bailed out over China. Thank you very much, Colin. That was well done, indeed. I'd like now to introduce um, Colonel Carol Glines, the historian uh, of the Doolittle Raiders. Colonel Glines uh, entered flying training in May of 1941 and graduated in January 1942. He was a flying instructor during World War II, followed by tours in Panama and Europe. He received MBA and MA degrees while on active duty and served on the Air Force University staff before a seven-year tour in the offices of the Secretary of, Air, of the Air Force and Assistant Secretary of Defense. His final assignment uh, was as Chief Public Affairs for the Alaskan Command. After retirement in 1968, Colonel Glines was an aviation magazine editor and wrote 36 books, including three books on the Tokyo Raid. Please welcome Colonel Carol Glines. Thank you, sir. That young man who preceded us did a super job of telling the story. Well, I have a little visual to accompany his presentation. April the 18th, 1942. April 18th, 1942. 16 B-25s, Mitchell medium bombers, sit on the pitching deck of an aircraft carrier at sea. Their mission? Bomb Tokyo, just four months after the attack on Pearl Harbor. It had three real purposes. One purpose was to give the folks at home the first good news that we had had in World War II. It caused the Japanese to question their warlords. And from a tactical point of view, it caused the retention of aircraft in Japan for the defense of the home islands when we had no intentions of hitting them again seriously in the near future. Those airplanes would have been much more effective 
in the South Pacific where the war was going on. A Navy captain named Lowe conceived the idea of taking Army medium bombers off of a Navy carrier and attacking Japan. The B-25 was selected because it was small, because it had the sufficient range to carry 2,000 pound bombs 2,000 miles, and because it took off and handled very well. First, I found out what B-25 unit had had the most experience, and then went to that crew, that organization, and uh, called for volunteers. And the entire group, including the group commander, volunteered. The training was hard. No one had ever taken off a fully loaded B-25 in less than 500 feet. First, they had to prove it could be done. Then they had to train the people to do it. Before they were through, one of the Mitchells would lift off in only 287 feet. The crews proved they were good, and so were their airplanes. The raid was carefully planned. Nothing was left to chance. Norton bomb sites were replaced by 20 cent improvised models to prevent the secret devices from falling into enemy hands. Doolittle then considered what to do if the task force was spotted by the Japanese. If we were intercepted by Japanese surface or aircraft, our aircraft would immediately leave the decks. If they were within range of Tokyo, they would go ahead and bomb Tokyo, even though they would run out of gasoline shortly thereafter. That was the worst thing we could think of. And uh, if we were not in range of Tokyo, uh, we would go back to Midway. If we were not in range of either Tokyo or Midway, we would permit our airplanes to be pushed overboard so the decks could be cleared for the use of the carrier's own carrier hornet's own aircraft. On the morning of April 18, 1942, the task force was sighted by Japanese patrol boats. The boats were quickly destroyed, but they could have transmitted a position report. It was eight hours before scheduled takeoff, an additional 400 miles to the target. Gas reserves would be dangerously low, but they were spotted and they would have to go. our target, turn in a general southerly direction, get out to sea as quickly as possible, and after being out of sight of land, turn and take a westerly course to China. We came in on the deck. We pulled up to about 1,500 feet to bomb in order to make sure that we weren't hit by the fragments of our own bomb. that the feeling was get the job done and get the heck out of there. The actual damage done by the raid was minimal. We